Hey everyone, today I'm going to do a tutorial on how to watercolor paint this truck and camper. Um, this is my friend's truck and I wanted to paint it for him because it's, um, it's an important thing to him. Him and his wife uh, like to camp a lot and they take this truck out pretty much every weekend. Uh, so I thought he'd appreciate uh, a painting of it. Figured I'd do a quick tutorial to show how I painted this one. Here I'm just laying down the the center line of the paper so that I can position the sketch roughly in the center of the canvas. And you can see I'm taking measurements straight from my computer screen where I have the reference image displayed and I'm doing this because I want to get just the, the overall proportions correct of the the greenhouse of the truck, the cab, and the, the truck bed. So I really just measured out the, the total length by the total height of the truck and the rest I'm gonna eyeball. Always lay down your construction lines as straight lines because it's it's a lot easier afterward to come over those construction lines and add a little bit of uh, crown or, or pump to that line or add radiuses between two lines later. One thing I always do is I my first pencil marks are as light as I can make them just in case I want to adjust. And the, the saying I use is sketch light until you get it right and then you can come over over top of that sketch line with something a little heavier. Taking another quick measurement on the screen just to make sure I get the, the top of the wheel arch in the right place because that's sort of an important visual aspect of the truck. The wheel arches and the, the wheels are really the only non-rectilinear lines on the truck and so it's important that they feel realistic and, and not too wonky. And now I'm looking at the shadow above the wheel but under the front wheel arch just so I can position the top part of the ellipse that will become the wheel. Sketching the second trapezoid that will be the rear wheel arch. Again, laying down straight construction lines and then radiusing between them. The camper has a slight angle coming off of the rear bumper, angles upwards. And I'm just eyeballing the air gap between the roof of the truck and the, the bottom of the camper. The gas cap is just a rectangle, so I sketch a, a flat rectangle and I can add the radiuses on the corners later. And on the rear fender, there's a, a highlight, and so I indicate that in pencil so that I can avoid it with any watercolor so it remains a highlight. And here I'm, I'm sketching in the inboard side of the camper that, that faces the back of the cab. And this is one of the first times that I have to pay attention to the perspective of the drawing. The intersection of those two innermost planes on the camper that intersect at a 90 degree angle, the, the intersection between those two is the first line that will directly indicate the perspective line of the truck and so it's important to pay attention to where the vanishing point is within the reference image. Here I'm darkening that perspective line that I was just referencing. Ellipses are really hard to sketch on the wheels and so you can see what I'm doing is marking the top, bottom, left, and right 
outer bounds of the ellipse and then connecting between. Then I'm coming in and striking those perspective lines since I've found the vanishing point in the image. And the vanishing point is critical to have identified while you're drawing ellipses so that you know where the, the major and minor axes are in each ellipse. You can see I'm correcting the ellipse here to, to respect the perspective lines. The vanishing point is between the front and rear wheels, and so the effect of that was both ellipses will be taller than they are wide. And I'm indicating the highlight above the front fender as well, since that's another area where we'll want to omit leaving any watercolor. Here I'm starting to sketch in the the ground plane and the shadow that's cast from the truck onto the ground plane. The wheel on the far side is another crucial indicator of perspective, so pay close attention to where it's positioned relative to the other wheels that are in the foreground. Now that we've zoomed into the sketch a little more, you can see the construction lines and the perspective lines and where I've placed the vanishing point. Once you're feeling confident in the construction you've made, as I am here, you can come through and darken some of the, the lines that are on the leading edge of the vehicle, basically the outermost silhouette of the whole form. Darkening the leading edge of the sketch is a really good way to tell the brain where the, the form stops. And this is a, a trick I've used in industrial design sketching for a long time. And it helps a lot even when you have an object in front of another object in space. You can dark the leading edge of the, the foreground object to, to help sell the fact that it's a, a distinct object from the one behind it. So the underlay is finished and so I'm coming through with my first wash layer of water and I'm just putting the water where I want color to flow. So again I'm avoiding any highlights on the truck. I'm coming down with a sort of a light purple blue color. Um, you can see it in the reference image pretty well and I'm avoiding adding any color to the, the top belt line of the truck where I can see a, a distinct height light that runs all the way from the, the hood through to the back of the truck bed. And there's just a small little shadow core on that front bumper. And the two wheel arches have pretty hot highlights on top of them as well, except for on the, the rear edge where I've added a little bit of tone. And there's a thin shadow core that runs just above both of the wheel arches that I'm indicating here. And I think I actually came in a little too dark with that layer. You can see it's now the same value as the rest of the, the door side, but I can fix that by adding darker value back by the, the baseboard. And it's really clear in the reference image if you look at the, the very bottom of the, the door jam that there's this orange-yellow light that's reflected from the environment and from the ground. You can actually see the grasses behind the truck are the same color, and I think it's because it's reflecting that, that color environment from the ground. Um, and so you'll see me come back in on that bottom edge with more of that yellow color that really sells the underglow from the ground. 
And this is a cast shadow from the camper on top of the truck. Cast shadows are crucial for describing the form that you're painting, and so you want to pay attention to how it lands on the surface. And the shadow on the side of the camper and that cast shadow are some of the, the darker shadows on, on the side of the truck, ignoring the, the wheel wells and the, the, the shadow on the ground. I'm adding a little bit of purple into those shadows just because it, it looks blue-purple in the reference image. I'm warming up that, that reflected light near the baseboard. And this is an interesting area. You can get a little bit of that environmental ground reflection on the bottom side of the, the camper there where I added some yellow. Just putting a little red and orange in the respective tail and headlights. Remember on this front window, there's not only shadow within the cabin that I'm indicating here, but there's a small rubber gasket that runs around the window as well. You'll see me continually darkening the, the wheel wells and the underside of the vehicle and the wheels. And this is because in order for a painting to, to look nice, it has to have a, a pretty good range of light and shadow. And you can tell right now, the whole truck almost looks like it's painted gray. And the way to help push the truck body into looking more white is to darken the darker values. And the, the darkest darks will help you define what the lighting environment is. And the darkest darks will help describe what the true color of the truck body is. can start to sculpt the form of the truck by using more shadows and you could see I'm doing that on the wheel arches and the rear side of the tailgate. And I'm just indicating the little black plastic cap on top of the bumper and the little roof rail up above the cab. The windshield has some blue light that it's reflecting from the sky. If you look closely at the reference image you can see it and so I came through and indicated that blue light on the windshield, and it helps define the windshield from the body in white. And I'm continuing the process of darkening the darkest values in the image, and this is an ongoing process. You, you don't really want to do it all at once. Um, you need to wait for each layer to dry somewhat so that you can add more shadow value on top. If you add more layers prematurely, the, the water, the pool from the brush stroke can sort of push the pigment out to the edges of that shape and the effect is brightening rather than darkening. Um, and so you want to wait until the paper is somewhat dry to add another shadow layer. And you see me periodically dabbing with a paper towel. Um, watercolor is somewhat editable for a few minutes after you lay it down. If, if you get outside the lines, you can dab it up with a paper towel. You could also come back at a later time and just with clear water, wet the portion of tone that you want to remove, and that can sometimes help pick at least a, a, some of it up. You can see I did it there on the wheel. And avoid the temptation to just darken the whole wheel and tire at once. Tires are actually more complex forms than you immediately realize. If you, if you cut a tire in half or, or section it, 
It's sort of two trapezoid bowl shapes stacked on top of one another. And so you have portions of the tire that are in darkness and portions of the tire that get environmental highlights. And it's important for describing the form of the tire to pay attention to those. And so you can see that's why I'm sort of taking my time to indicate each of those shadow cores and highlights on the tire. In the, in the reference image, the shadow is one of the darkest values on the whole image, but since I'm doing the truck on a white background, I don't want the shadow to compete for visual attention from the truck, and so I'm not going to darken the shadow nearly as dark as it is in the reference image. Oh, the shadow can be light because the viewer of this painting doesn't, doesn't know the environment that the park the truck is parked in or or what the ground plane looks like and i added blue into the shadow to to cool down the whole shadow and, and give a little bit of dynamic color to the whole image since the truck is more purple i'm not sure why but adding these graphic elements to the trailer is really fun and satisfying I think it's because you're not painting with light anymore, but you're actually painting distinct graphic shapes, and it starts to make the, the detail in the image come alive. You don't need to go too nuts with detail on these small vent features since you can come back in with pen and add the necessary detail as your final layer. I'm adding more warm reflected light here in the uh, inboard side of the camper just because it you can see in the image it does reflect a lot of the grasslands around the truck. And these crossbars on the roof are aluminum, so they really have sort of the same value range as the camper shell. And so I just came through with a very light blue-gray color. And I'm realizing now I forgot to sketch in the the wing mirror on the truck door and so I'm just putting it in in pencil and painting in the cast shadow. These graphic stripes really have the same value as the the window, the rear window, and so I'm punching up the stripes with a little bit darker pigment. There's a little tiny cool cast shadow just from the upper rim on the camper that I'm adding in. And on the front hood spoiler I'm leaving two little white stripes where you can see the, the curving plastic material reflects a pretty bright highlight. The, the physical and mechanical technique of, of painting I don't think is really the hard part or the difficult part. What I've learned practicing is it's really about seeing all the elements within the reference image and, and knowing the important hierarchy of, of light and shadow that, that describes the form that you're painting. This is by far the most fun part of the process is all the watercolor wash layers are more or less done at this point and so I'm coming through with a 005 weight micron pen and 
doing exactly what I described earlier, which is sort of outlining in a thicker line weight the leading edge of each object and adding very, very light, sometimes even dotted line weight to lines that are non-leading edge. When an object sits in the foreground or in front of another object in space, you can punch up the line weight around that foreground object with a little bit thicker line weight. And it just really helps create the illusion of depth in space. And for the viewer, it makes it clear that one object is in front of the other. And so this is a pretty important aspect to the line weight process, in my opinion. So for this wheel arch, where it's highlighted, you'll notice this is not a leading edge, and so I sort of very lightly stipple or dot the line so that the line weight doesn't appear as dark, especially in areas where there's highlight. You can see towards the bottom of the wheel arch where there's shadow, I punched up the line weight slightly more. And this is because when something's blown out with a highlight, you, you don't really see the seam as much as when it's in shadow. If you look at the reference image, it's pretty clear on the rear wheel arch. And you can see even in the interior, this is the outer bound of the object, right? You can see through that window to the environment. And so I, I layered on some pretty thick line weight around the, the seat and steering wheel. Now I'm coming in and adding in that detail of those small little vent louvers. This ink layer is your opportunity to really enhance the image with, with detail and, and sell the, the realism of the image. The watercolor layer is about defining the form and, and visually sculpting it, but the pen layer is really about creating detail and visual interest, and so I think it's just as important as the watercolor layer. So at this point I get to come through with the, the white Prismacolor pencil and clean up and sort of correct some of the the highlights that weren't perfect in watercolor and also add small highlights on top of darker watercolor pigment. The, the white color pencil is kind of like a little cheat code for editing details and form at the very end. And this door ding guard is a good example of how to use the white color pencil. You can see I punched up the highlight on the top of that and that trim piece and it really sells that it's protruding towards the camera in space and you follow it up with a little bit of shadow on the underside. I'm just adding the tiniest bit of red pigment into the TRD lettering and the last step is sign your name. So after this I come through and add just a few final touches but thanks for watching and Please reach out to me and let me know if you have any tips or suggestions since this is a learning process for me as well. And also feel free to comment and ask questions about my process and I hope you enjoy it. Thanks.